Let's do the damn thing, huh? All right, everybody. Um, I've been dropping shells for a minute. I like owning shit. So I uh, wanted to talk about how I think pen testing is changing. And a lot of this is just a pure rant. So if anybody knows me, they know I drink. I drink a lot. And I, I tend to get in these freaking rants where I just, just drives me crazy about where the industry is. So that's a, I'm sorry if you wanted to learn anything important, you're free to leave right now. Because this is just a rant. All right, guys, who the heck am I? I'm a network pen tester, trainer, app pen tester guy, the black guy at security conferences. That's me. In case you guys didn't know, that's me. All right, guys, how do I do what I do? I hack, I curse, I drink, the order changes, but the things that I do, that, that's it, right? So um, this is me. All right, guys, so let me take you back. I can recall many, many moons ago uh, exploiting a whole lot of Solaris, a whole lot of uh, fucking HPUX. I mean, the good old days, man. I used to own all kinds of shit. And you, you did it about like this. If anybody remembers, remember InMap? when it was version one. So we in map, you actually banner grab by hand, you telnet it into ports. Anybody remember that stuff? Anybody remember root shell? Anybody remember packet storm? Like, like years ago, <laughs> right? Anybody remember when Nessus was free? <laughs> right? Anybody remember when Snort was free? Like when open source actually meant they weren't gonna make a profit from it? Anybody, nobody, okay, nobody remembers that. Okay, I guess it's just me. So after what we did back then was we just owned everything. I mean, all we wanted customers to do was apply a patch. And we used to tell the customer like, it's free. Just, just apply it. And I remember customers would say stuff to me like, yeah, but what if it breaks something? That was the only concern that they had. Really, no one cared about security at the time. And then we'd write a report and we'd tell the customer that their network sucked. <laughs> well, it hasn't changed that much since then. We get paid. So what's pen testing like today? Well, you have your scoping call. You tell the customer how thorough you're gonna be while you're promising that you're not gonna break anything. Then you run your vulnerability scanner, Nessus, Nexpos, Qualys, whatever it is, and then you get on Twitter all day. Then you take your exploit framework, Metasploit, Core, Saint, whatever, and then you use the same exploits as what? It's okay, read the slide last week. After that, we copy and paste the results from last week's report into this report. Because it's the same vulnerabilities, right? Weak passwords, uh, weak SSL, cross-site scripting and SQL injection. It's the same stuff, right? Now, we give the customer recommendations that we absolutely know that they're never going to implement. Yes? Yes? Who's done pen test and come back the very next year only to find the same vulnerabilities present? Don't act like it's just me. Yes, yes. Right, and then what do we get back to? It's okay, read the slide. We get back on Twitter and we talk about anonymous and lulsec and stuff like that and then we use the buzzword. What's the buzzword? APT. And that's our life. That's our life. We live a copy paste scanner life. That, that's it. Does anybody? Who like thought being a pen tester would be so cool and now you find that all you do is copy paste last week's report, talk on Twitter, and run Metasploit? Anybody? Okay, I guess you're not pen testers. Okay, well, that's the life. Now, today, you have so many security measures in the network and this is what amazes me. I've been on networks where they have endpoint protection, proxies, reverse proxies, load balancers, application gateways, XML gateways, all protecting like a Solaris 7 box. <laughs> like they spend more money in defensive shit than they actually spend fixing the shit <laughs> in some places. Has anybody seen this network? Right? You, you, you spend so much money in all this defensive stuff and none of it's ever configured properly. Right? So I pen tested a customer. I pen tested a customer and they asked me to um, test this one subnet. So I test the subnet, I find some stuff, I go over and I'm talking to one of the customers and I'm like, you know, 
I found some MySQL servers that are misconfigured. Um, looks like you really need some updates on these four servers. They're in the DMZ. Now, I talk to the customer, and the lead developer comes over, and he's like, oh, well, those are our dev servers. And I was like, but they're, they're, in, the, they're in the DMZ. He's like, yeah, those are our, our development boxes. I was like, but they're in the... <laughs> you know how you're like... You ever like look at somebody and you start wondering, okay, this has got to be a joke. He's, he's fucking with me. He's really fucking with me, right? <laughs> they're in the, the D... You know, I'm starting to spell it out. D... MZ is where the development stuff is. Waiting for him to be like, oh, no, no, I meant, it, 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 no. No, it really wasn't like that. He says it made it easier for them to move code from development to production. I was like, no shit. <laughs> no shit, really, it does, huh? So now we have to have a meeting, right? Now you have to have a meeting to talk about the meeting that you're gonna have because somebody did something this fucking stupid, right? So. I have a meeting and they say, okay, well, guys, what we're going to do is we're going to talk to the dev team and find out why they think it's easier to keep this stuff in the production network. So we get over there and we have to have a meeting with the deputies before it goes to the CIO. And you, you know how it all goes, right? Like three months later, we're still having this discussion. They asked me, hey, Joe, since you're here, would you mind helping us with um, securing some of our Unix platform stuff? I said, sure. Um, I'll do a document, make some screenshots for you on how to, how to properly secure a Solaris machine. You got a machine I can log into, take screenshots, and they, oh yeah, sure, we'll, we'll get you one. So they get me this box. Now, they can't find the password for it for like a week. They finally find a password for the box. And I log into it over Telnet, over Telnet, in the DMZ. <laughs> And I'm like, why is this box taking so damn long to log in? I mean, literally like three minutes to log in. Over. Tell me in the. Now I finally get logged into the box and I'm like, Jesus Christ, this damn box is slow. So I run check rootkit on it. This fucking thing's got five rootkits on the box. <laughs> Hackers are elbowing each other for fucking room on the box, right? So now we have to have a meeting for the mother meeting to, to talk about the next meeting about this box in addition to the stuff that's in the DMZ because this box is also in the DMZ. Now, talking to the customer about it, and then the customer says to me, well, didn't our IDS detect any of that? And I said, well, no, because that is the IDS. <laughs> You love this, right? So this box is the IDS. Let's say this one more time. This box is the IDS. Now they had paid for a managed security service provider. The managed security service provider, who's a very large corporation who I can't name because it'll probably embarrass some of you who actually work there. The SLA expired four years prior. The customer kept sending them money. But because the SLA had expired, the MSSP dropped management of the box. They kept collecting the check each damn month. <laughs> so I guess the whole point that I'm trying to say is that company that was owned that bad had one of the highest ratings in regulatory compliance. They're secure. Because they had network monitoring. Check. They had intrusion prevention. Check. I can't say what compliance it was because you guys will probably figure out who the customer is. Okay, so 
the whole point that I'm getting at is people have all this stuff in the network, right? They have all these security mechanisms. And it's harder to pen test today because of all these security mechanisms. But what you're going to find is that we need to start focusing not on the fact that these security mechanisms are present, but how well they actually work, if at all. And if they're configured at all. And this buzzword, APT, I like it. I actually like it. Yes, I fear monger. That's me. Scare the piss out of the customer, damn it, yes. Tell them be fucking afraid. Be very, very afraid. The Chinese are coming to get you. <laughs> Be afraid, okay? All right, guys, two quotes that sum up APT. All right, APT, there are people that are smarter than you. They have more resources for you, and they're coming for you. Good luck with that. <laughs> My next one, when it comes to companies and government slash military ties, valuable intellectual property or lots of money, they generally fall into one of two categories. People, what are those categories? Please. So we have to let them know, this is where you are. This is a situational report. All right, guys. When you start looking at the defensive mechanisms that we have in place in today's networks, things like antivirus that are trivially bypassed with simple, simple EXE modification. Most people can use packers and obfuscators, trivially bypass antivirus, upload it to virus total, knowing that it'll be good for at least a week before deploying it on your network. So that's kind of a waste. Vulnerability assessments. Today, getting into the network does not necessarily rely on the presence of a vulnerability. And this is something I'm gonna harp on real hard. Getting past host-based firewalls, two-factor authentication, email filtering, you can read the slide, it's all easy. If it's easier to steal it than it is to reverse engineer it or R&D it, guess what they're gonna do? They're gonna freaking steal it. I got a customer with confirmed APT. By the time we got there, by the time we got there, the attackers had had domain admin privileges in the network for over a year. By the time we got there, it's like, hey, we're here. Um, can I talk to the admins? I mean, the, the hackers, I mean, the, you know, the, the guys who run the network. Them, right? They've had control of the network for so long, the attackers were literally coming in, stealing project plans. And I mean even stealing management training. They're like stealing Six Sigma training. And coming back at the next quarterly updates. Like they were, you know, hey, we got our stuff. Okay, the next milestone for the project is in July. The hackers were like, dude, we'll be back on the second week to check in, see where y'all are at. <laughs> right? And the thing about it is who's getting on with this stuff? And man, it's Lottie Dottie every motherfucking body. If you look, right? You got Lockheed Martin, Northrop Gunman, L3, Booz Allen, SAIC, jump on the financials, right? IMF, Citi, uh, IOC, you know, you, you look around, dude, it's everybody. You got law firms getting owned because people are realizing that, you know what, if I get into the vendor or the supplier of the target, that's another way for me to get into this company. So you've got some organizations that are multi-billion dollar organizations. They've got the money to buy useless SIM products and defensive stuff that we know doesn't work. But then you've got these smaller organizations who don't have these resources and they're getting owned even worse. So I'm trying to show you this because I want you guys to start changing the way that we look at security and start using the buzzwords to help you get more business, convey your point. We all know that APT is the stupidest fucking thing in the world. We, we all know it, we're family, we can say it. It's stupid, it's stupid. Is it, is, is it really advanced? Come on, did you see the RSA email? Like really? That's advanced. <laughs> no, it's not advanced, but it's proving a point that when it comes to your intellectual business property and what it does, what it is that makes your business work, that has value, that's what I love about APT. They're stealing the stuff that matters. Okay, so let's look at the organizations in the previous slides. Do they have regularly updated information assurance programs? All those companies we just listed, the answer is? Do they have configuration management and change management programs? 
Do they have a dedicated IT security budget? Do they have dedicated IT security staff? Are all of those organizations pen tested at least annually? And most importantly, are all of those organizations compliant? The answer is, yeah. Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. So here's something that it, it's kind of really been bothering me. Now, you could say it's my midlife crisis, but I don't feel that I'm really providing a lot of value as a pen tester anymore. I honestly, honestly, in my heart, because it's just us and it's not like they're recording and gonna put this on YouTube. I could talk to you guys, right? I honestly, in my heart, feel like I'm doing the customer a disservice by pen testing them now. What real business value am I giving you by telling you what a scanner can tell you? What, you're telling me the customer can't fucking read? Right, oh, sometimes, right? But what real business value does pen testing have? You, you know, to just say, here's the vulnerabilities in your environment, go patch them. Aren't there tools out there that can do that for the customer? And in a lot of cases, actually patch the, patch the vulnerabilities for the customer? In a lot of cases, cheaper than it would cost to hire me to tell you to patch the shit that's fucked up in your environment, yes? So, I'm saying that, guys, too many people think that APT is about O-Day and advanced exploits and all that kind of stuff. All they want is all you got. APT is about somebody who's trying to steal what it is that makes your business run, right? That's what has business impact. That's part of your BCP. That's part of your DRP. That's part of your risk assessment. This is somebody who is hell-bent on stealing your ability to, to do business. That's what it's all about. So if pen testing to us is to replicate the hacker threat and show the customer how, how resilient they are to the hacker threat, is what we're doing running scanners and showing them their vulnerabilities, is that an accurate representation of how the hacker will break in today? No. So, if you look at this stuff and you say, all right, what about the new strides that are going on in pen testing, like goal-oriented pen testing? Goal-oriented pen testing is one of the things where you set like a, uh, a flag or a marker. You say, hey, I need you to get X to prove to me that that you can do this. I need you, I had one customer say, I need you to tell me how much money my boss makes. I had another customer says, hey, if you can get to the SWIFT network and show that you can move money, that's a success. I had another customer who says, well, I need you to get the two social security numbers of the two investors in this bank with the largest accounts. You know, that's goal-oriented pen testing. And I think that's a step in the right direction. It's a step in the right direction, but I don't think that's where it needs to go. If you look at this stuff, guys, you look at things like viruses. Is this lapel mic working? Oh, no. Is that video? Oh, I'm like. Guys in the back, like. <laughs> All right, guys, so if you look down on the bottom left here, you'll see you got viruses, DDoSs, worms, and you start to see from minor annoyance all the way up to the top right in this heat graph of what has the most significant impact to a business. And it's things like coordinated attacks, targeted malware. These things have the most impact to a business because they actually steal the business's ability to do what the business is there for. I can make money and ruin the employees' lives. That's what businesses do, right? Oh, don't laugh. You know it's true, right? We want to make money at the expense of the poor schleps who are doing the damn work, right? That's business. <laughs> and when hackers are fucking with that, that's not a good thing. That's un-American. That's why it's Chinese. All right. <laughs> I hope that some Chinese people do, please don't beat me up. <laughs> All right, guys, so we've got a vulnerability-driven industry, right? So everybody remember the whole threat, asset, vulnerability matrix that we all learned in school, where you're like, hey, here's your asset. This is what's important. Here's the threat. This is the bad hacker who's going to break in, and it can only break in because of the presence of a what? 
a vulnerability. So the entire information assurance program concept is focused on the removal of the vulnerability from that. Now, if we look at how APT works, is a vulnerability required? If I send you an email or drop a USB key, does there have to be a vulnerability exploited to get code execution? Go ahead, answer. I'll wait. How many vulnerabilities does That's a good point. Okay. So when you look at that, a vulnerability isn't required. I don't need a vulnerable version of Adobe. I don't need a vulnerable version of Internet Explorer to just get you to click on a link. So this whole program concept where you've been focusing on the removal of vulnerabilities from your environment, I don't want to say it's a waste of time because that would be the truth, but what you really want to say is it's not where your focus should be if you have a mature information assurance program. If you've made a dedicated effort to removing vulnerabilities from your environment, now it's time to start looking at what hackers actually do. So we start looking at how APT works, right? There's generally going to be some, some targeted open source intelligence where they're going to be collecting information about you. Then they're going to figure out what's the most likely infection vector to get into the network. Then they're going to pilfer, grab all the stuff in the network, and move laterally. Lateral movement, these are the things that you want to be able to detect as they're pilfering and moving laterally and then exfiltrating data out of the network. These are the things that you want to be able to detect. And specifically because these things don't change as rapidly as the exploits. So on a typical day, if you watch ExploitDB or PacketStorm or any of the security websites, you have somewhere between 30 and 50 new exploits released per day. Per day. Now, if you actually look at how a person moves from computer to computer, is it changing that rapidly? Has net use and PSExec changed that rapidly in the last 15 years? <laughs> Right? The things that a hacker does when he's on a machine to pilfer the network and move laterally and then exfiltrate data out of the network doesn't change as rapidly as the exploits do. But all the buzz and the hype is around the what? The exploits. If that's changing all the time, if every day you patch tomorrow, you're going to have more vulnerabilities to patch. Right? But how many customers can really detect registry modification throughout their network? service modification throughout their network. For example, a common APT tactic is to use the wireless discovery service as the service for actually running your backdoor executable. Because in a corporate environment, you generally don't need your wireless discovery service, right? You're, you're, you're hardwired in. So it's a great service to keep enabled and run your backdoor under that service name. Does that make sense? These are the types of things that we as security consultants and pen testers need to start trying to get our customers to understand. Can you actually detect malicious activity? These are the things that hackers do. These are the directories where hackers like to hide files. Can you, can you detect um, a large data transfer? Can you detect uh, the same set of credentials being used across hundreds of machines in your environment? Can you detect those things? Because that's hacker activity. When you look at a person who's moving across three, four hundred machines in a day with the same set of credentials, and it's not one of your service accounts that's doing patch management or configuration management, someone should be pulling a WTF, right? Like, dude, what the hell is that? Because if we had looked at those types of things, if we were monitoring outbound traffic, we'd be able to detect this stuff, right? Because really, man, they're good, but they're not that damn good. So APT doesn't rely on vulnerabilities. I love where people are going with data-driven assessments. I think it's very forward-thinking, but I don't think there's enough focus on where it needs to go. And this is what I'm talking about. It needs to change. It needs to change. All right. The security industry is focused on minimizing the presence of vulnerabilities. What I want to introduce to you is a concept I call it capability-based security assessments. What I think is more important now is to measure the customer's ability to detect and respond to malicious activity. That's more important. How well can a customer detect malicious activity? How quickly do they respond to it? If I create a domain admin account in your environment, how long does it take you to figure out that that has happened? 
if, if 40 machines in your environment have new services created, how long does it take for you to figure out that that happened? Then how long does it take for you to investigate it? Those are the types of things that we want to start asking our customers. And you're gonna find that you're gonna get some pretty peculiar looks from your customers because they're gonna be, well, well, damn, uh, I don't know how long it would take us to respond to that. That's because they're already owned, right? It's not a pen test, this is incident response, right? In every case, this is the things that I'm finding out. So I've broken it down into five phases. So we want to rate the customer and how well they do in identifying when these phases are happening to them, when the attacker is doing this to them. Can you detect when someone is doing their targeting and information gathering? And how much of this information do you have that's publicly available that would be used, potentially could be used against you? Initial entry, once a person has gotten into the network via spear phishing, via USB key, or whatever the case may be, how well can you detect it and what level of sophistication can you actually detect? The next thing, post exploitation. When a person is data mining your network file system or your host based file system, you know, can you detect that? And then lateral movement, as people are moving from computer to computer in your environment, can you detect that? Data exfiltration, when the data is leaving your network, can you detect that? And what level of sophistication can you detect? So that's that process. And now let's kind of break it down into some categories. I try to keep these really, really simple, right? Because it, you know, you're not trying to make it one of these massive complex risk charts, but you're just trying to get it so that the customer can kind of get a feel of what they can defend against, right? Anybody? Anybody ever used to get in a lot of fights as a little kid? Nobody? You weren't like me? I fought a lot. Where's, there's my people. There's my people, right? Okay. If you were one of those kids who got into a lot of fights, you knew who you could whoop, didn't you? After a couple of ass whoopings, you knew, oh, that kid? Mm, I ain't messing with him. That little kid? Oh, I'm fucking him up today. Watch this, <laughs> right? It's kind of the same concept, right? You need to know, okay, the little ankle biter script kitty who's just running scanners and running Metasploit and all that, oh, we can handle his ass. Oh, we, we got that, okay? But that dude who's writing his own custom binaries, writing his own exploits, you know, that dude, no, we probably ain't gonna mess with him. His sister's cute, but I ain't messing with him, right? <laughs> That's what we're trying to get here. Can we deal with a person who's just a script kitty who just downloads stuff and runs stuff? Can we deal with a person who I call them got some game? I usually quote those as equivalents of sysadmins. People who are fairly technical, know some Windows, know some Linux, know some Cisco, might have a little bit of scripting background, but they're not hackers per se. Okay, but you know, to give you an idea of how technical this person is, the next group would be that organized crime, hacker for hire. This is a person who this is this is pretty much his job. He's good at this. He writes his own customized binaries. He uh, writes his own shell code if necessary. He can do the modifications to get past common security mechanisms, and he's pretty comfortable with it. Okay, and then your last guy is the state-sponsored guy. These are the guys using zero-day exploits, using their own um, their own Trojans that they've built from scratch. You know, that's that's kind of the more high-level stuff. All right, so let's look at that phase one: the targeting, all the stuff that we find in press releases on LinkedIn. You know, everybody's very familiar with this, using tools like Multigo, Passive Recon, FOCA. Most of you guys are very familiar with this kind of stuff. The thing that I want you guys to start looking at is the initial entry. Here's some things that I've been using with customers lately. So your script kitty stuff, all the way down to your most, ex your, your, your most elite stuff, right? Can the, can the customer catch a client-side exploit that's less than a year old. Client-side exploit, you know, MS1103, the .NET bug that works against Internet Explorer 8 uh, for Windows 7 is a good example of a bug to test against. You'll find that it works in a lot of environments where you think it shouldn't, right? But hey, we're running Windows 7, we should be good. Not realizing that they don't have good updated versions of .NET, this bug still works, okay? Vulnerabilities that are less than 90 days old. You're starting to notice as we go down this chain, these are getting tougher, okay? Get in a customer who can respond to vulnerabilities, client-side vulnerabilities that are less than 90 days old. That's a customer who's very prepared. They don't see a lot of that out there. Now we get down to that next step. 
where they've got their patch management really under control. You're, you really aren't going to be able to exploit them with you know a bug that's less than two months old. But fishing for credentials, that's that next level. Okay. So if we can't get in with these first, that's the next step we're going to go to. We're going to spear fish for credentials. We're going to a fake site, and we might even go so far as domain names domain names to places like WebSense and Bluecoat, so authorized, and yes, we do do this on penetration tests, so we buy the domain name, we submit it to a site like um, uh, Bluecoat WebSense, we get it authorized, we get it capitalized, and then we'll use mod proxy to redirect to a real website, and then with mod proxy redirecting to a real website, you can find sites within your site that don't redirect, and pages within your site that you deploy your malicious content. Your next thing will be your file format. These are bugs, GFs, bugs in Excel, bugs in the office, these types of things. You have this stuff in Metasploit. Your after that, we move into the list. The use type bugs, things like your job embeds, where your executables inside of things, like ActiveX control applets, where they in the context of the. Bug. This is really really. Um, you're up against something like a. I ran into this about a week past, where the was running semantic infection, that TMG replacement for the server, and it's running an auth computer account and an act user account in directory route out of the network. But we had to bypass endpoint protection, and we had to bypass environment for application, and it needed a legit account in the networks. So I could plug in a pump. And then it's going to be your customized exploit, taking the exploit, modifying bypasses, and or find the payload that my path by maybe. And the last, final your state sponsor level stuff. Companies fail, fail miserably one and two. So what we're trying in each case to get the customer to understand that we're trying to four, five, six, trying to get. With you, we're going to do this until you get to that point. We're effectively handling four. You know, five is be tough, but we get you there. Okay. But here's some things of how you could do stuff. Here's putting this is just simple. it's an executable uh, use template with pun. a lot of people. On the internet's a really way to do it. The things that you might do, I can tell you, we ended up having build a a customized interpreter in GW with standard libraries. So once it did with libraries from the default tree, um, and then with the main GW patch of randomness, that really does get our point protection. So Java bug things work really good. Um, do some modifications. The thing missing my cafe. Semantic tend to on the script that actually loads, but not the itself. So those are going to be looking to change by. And then my the RSA. Absolutely love it. this. Is it's persistent. Forward out to you for review. Open it. That's advanced. So that initial stuff, talk about post-education. Person is file system or pill for or can you do that stuff? So a couple things all these commands and commands. Um, I pinned network um, about a year where the in admin password was uh, excuse me, where yeah, the local admin password was George Bush. So they had a password spreadsheet that had all the passwords in the network. They had labeled the spreadsheet George Bush. So using like this find string command where you're searching inside of files. So like when you're using these dir commands, you're searching the file system for files that contain risk and password and things like that. But if you actually start searching in files, you'll find a bunch of that stuff. Always search for things like risk assessment, investment, invoice, 
things like that. Remember, the goal is to show how we would do damage to this company or how we would find information that could be damaging to the company. Okay, lateral movement. Can the customer detect you moving files between shares? Are they in an environment where they even allow file sharing? You know, for example, you try to get customers not to allow uh, PC to PC file sharing. You really want them to use some sort of SAN or NAS solution and not share files between PCs. One of the things that I ran into very recently, which was absolutely the hardest thing I ever had to pen test, was they actually used IPsec, not the encryption, but just the filtering rules, to not allow workstations to communicate at all. So if you wanted to communicate with something, you needed to communicate with that in the server network. They had a local admin account called Analyze. The local admin account called Analyze, let's say all these white tables are the PCs, let's say all the chairs in the back are the admin machines, and then up here is the server network. The PCs all had a local admin account called Analyze. The admins had that account. They could log into the PC with that account. The Analyze account was not on the, piece, on, the, on the admin PCs, was not on the server PCs. So if you spearfished and you got on this network, if you collected the, the uh, local admin account with let's say WCE or Mimikatz or something like that, you can't go anywhere with it. Inter-PC communication is not allowed. There's an explicit deny rule that traffic cannot communicate with the admin network. So only traffic initiated from the admin network was allowed to come into the workstation network. So you could spearfish all you want, but you were locked wherever you spearfished. And you'd have to own something in the server network to try and get back to the admin network. Okay? It sounds like it's a pain in the butt, but these are the types of things that make it very difficult for attackers. And from an administrative standpoint, are a lot easier to deploy than you think. Now, how many of you like to do like memory analysis using tools like volatility and stuff like that? Memorize from like Mandiant, those types of tools. If you have this type of environment, you can use that local account to log into the machine, run your memory analysis tool like MemDD or MemDD64, snatch all the memory dump from that machine, pull it back to your analysis machine because you're using an account from the admin network that these users cannot use. Okay, so you can do real-time memory analysis and do your work without having to worry about the attacker moving laterally in the environment. Okay, all right, more things on lateral movement. A lot of use of things like net use, PS exec and PS exec like functionality. Real skilled guys will use the same thing as PS exec, but write their own tool that uses native uh, when API calls to execute that. These are the types of things that are real sophisticated. We're trying to see if people can detect this kind of stuff. Okay, data exfiltration. So data exfiltration, we want to rate what level of complexity and sophistication they can detect. Can you move data out of the network over any port? Can you move data out of the, move data out of the network over HTTP, over DNS, over ICMP? Can you do it over encrypted channels like HTTPS, SSH? Are you using an authenticated proxy? Does the attacker have to use some sort of highly customized protocol? These are the things that we want to know. What can the network actually defend against? Okay? And are you noticing that there's not a whole lot of focus on can you defend against the latest zero day? Right? How relevant is that? Because the answer is what? No. You know, damn it, if we could defend against zero days, we wouldn't have an industry, right? But what we need to do is look at what hackers do when they compromise something and see if we can defend against that stuff. And it always comes down to the things that we hate to say, but dude, you got to eat your vegetables. Dude, no clear text protocols in the network. Authenticate anything that's leaving the network. You can't tell me that this is shit you've never heard of. Right? But it's eating your vegetables, and what are customers like? Are customers like buzzwords? They like to spend money on buzzwords. It's like kids with candy, right? You've you got to eat your vegetables. All right, so do you see things like RAR files, encrypted RAR files? Do you see RAR files on shares? And do you regularly scan for that kind of stuff? Do you look for that? Do you regularly look for rogue access points? Do you have GPOs that don't allow the use of USB keys? You know, are you looking for the types of things that attackers are going to use more so than the testing for the presence of vulnerabilities? 
Okay. Now this is some kind of stuff that you might have to do that's some real crazy ninja stuff where you own something in the server network, bounce through the admin network to get to a data, a DBO's workstation and then route your stuff back through. But generally, I found that I've never had to do all this crazy wiggle and, you know, from network to network to get data out of it. Maybe, maybe twice in a year. I mean, literally, maybe two times in a year that I have to do something that complex. Most networks, most networks, I can find a, a person who's got a worldwide readable, worldwide writable share. I grab all the data around the network, raw it up in that person's share, and then start just copying it out of the network over clear text protocols. You know, and they don't do anything about it. And when you, when you start looking at APT tactics, this is what APT is actually doing, okay? So what about places where you hide stuff? You know, so for example, the system recycler folder or the system drive system volume or hidden directories, okay? Uh, system root tasks folder. You know, do you have things that test your file system for the presence of files in these directories? These are known directories where people hide malicious activity. You know, are you looking for that stuff? And if it was there, how long would it take you before you recognized it? Okay. All right, guys. Whoops. All right. Today's information assurance programs are, comp are comprised of vulnerability management, patch management, and user awareness training. And then what? What's the third thing? That's it. That is an information assurance program. We have patch management. We tell our users what not to click on, and we document it. That's it. And if you really think about it, you're trying to defend against a threat that's what we used to do 10 years ago. We don't hack this way anymore, right? If you read the Verizon threat report, and you read the Cisco threat reports and all this, you have documented proof that this is not how hacking works. So this information program concept, information assurance program concept, is flawed. You're trying to defend against an attack from the 90s. Right? Think about it. Right? You're trying to defend against stuff that people just don't hack this way anymore. Why aren't we as security consultants trying to let the customer know that this is dead? This is dead. You, can't, you have no fucking prayer of defending your network if this is all you do. You, you, dude, you might as well just, just, just give it up. Just go ahead. <laughs> like you might as well like you know just you know ask him to kiss you first you know tell me will you respect me in the morning you, you know like you might as well you have no chance right yeah exactly right and then seriously guys start thinking about that instead of telling the customer well you have 5,000 highs and 1,600 mediums and 30,000 lows start telling the customer what level of sophistication they can actually defend against uh, an attacker of XYZ skill set, XYZ sophistication, this is what he will probably be able to do, and this is what you could pretty competently defend against. And I think if you start telling people that, you actually give them more value. Because if all we do is give them a Nessus report, then why do they need us? Seriously, what is the value we bring if all we are is a scanner report and some you know, click button metasploit, right? To me, this is the stuff that I think is really important, and this is why I'm saying that pen testing needs to change. We have to start showing real value. Otherwise, how many of you remember being able to charge crazy rates for pen testing? I'm not kidding. I can remember when pen testing was 30 and 40K a week. I'm seeing people bidding on projects right now at three grand a week for pen tests. Now, guys, if all it is is start my scanner, click export, uh, click exploit, what's going to happen to the price of pen testing? What's going to happen to the salaries of security consultants and security people? Guys, what, what secretaries are going to be doing it, right? You have to add value. You can't expect a customer to pay you real money if you give him bullshit, right? You pay peanuts, you get monkeys. Right now, we got a whole lot of peanuts going out there, and most of the environment 
and then when it comes to testers, is what? Scanner monkeys. And it's our fault. It's our fault. We have to start making that change. And yeah, you know, that's what I said, it's a rant. You're probably not gonna learn shit, but you're gonna listen to me rant. So, you're free to leave if you don't wanna listen to the rant. But, okay, what about threat modeling and risk assessments? I still do a lot of threat modeling. I still do a lot of risk assessments. I'm a big believer in things like Stride, things, things like Dread, uh, OWASP, FAIR, Octave, ISO 27000. I really do like what's going on with risk assessments. I'm not saying that they don't have value. I'm not saying don't do them. But I am saying when you're pen testing, you need to realize that a pen test is a snapshot in time focused completely on the presence of vulnerabilities. But that's not what today's threat is. Okay, you've got things like attacker-centric threat modeling asset-centric threat modeling, software-centric threat modeling, you've got some really cool things. But most of these threat modeling matrices focus on asset times threat times vulnerability equals risk. That's the basic concept. You can flip from any one of them, but they all correlate assets, threats, and vulnerabilities. But when a vulnerability is not necessarily required, what does that do to your risk rating? It's skewed, if not useless, right? So again, I'm not saying get rid of, of threat modeling, but I do want you to think about threat modeling and risk assessments for their proper place, not pen testing. Pen testing needs to be about replicating the attacker threat. So we need to start doing analysis. Things like open IOC that Mandian is doing, that's good. That's good for the industry. We need to share data about hackers and what they're doing in our environments so we as testers can replicate that stuff. That's the only way that we're gonna give real value. All right, guys. All right. So vulnerability tracking systems, threat modeling, and risk assessment, I'm not saying get rid of them. They're good, they have a purpose. You definitely wanna start with a traditional information assurance program. You do need to have patch management, configuration management, user awareness training, you gotta have those things. But as soon as you become a real company and you've taken the training wheels off and you've got a real IA program, it's time to start really looking at what can we defend against and how well did we do it, okay? All right, guys. That's all I got. I will take questions. Are there any questions from the rant? <laughs> 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 All right, guys. I'm out of business cards. I'm sorry. You know, take take pictures if you want to get my email, phone number, all that good stuff. I'd be happy to talk to you. Um, this this whole capability-based pen testing thing was something I was working on for the last almost two years, and I'm really thinking that I'm moving in the right direction. I'm starting to get customers who are saying that they're liking it. I'm starting to talk to other pen testers who are saying that we're moving in the right direction. Guys, I'm really going to be trying to pimp this. Try to, you know, this isn't like glory hound for me. But start thinking about this stuff and the testing that you're doing. All right? All right, guys, thanks for putting up with all the cursing. Take care.